Does President Obama have genitalia? Or is he as smooth as a Ken doll? That's the real question we're asking ourselves. The answer might surprise you. And then we travel to Brazil to hitch a ride on a tow truck driving through the countryside late at night. We think we're just about to get our car towed safely to its destination to have it repaired the next day. Instead, we are going to find ourselves mesmerized by a terrifying true story of demonic possession and mystical ambulance. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. I hope you guys are having tons of fun doing whatever you're doing. I hope you guys had an awesome weekend. I went and saw the Rocky Horror show it wasn't a picture show it was a local play starring friend of the show rumple snitch or whatever he calls himself crinkle snatch or something i don't remember <laughs> he can't be that good of a friend if i don't remember his name no i hang out with him all the time really good friend of the show i got to see him in a yellow bikini brief and i, I could have done without that but other than that rocky horror show was great a uh, fantastical night for all but, oh, no, and there's something, <laughs> something actually show-related. I was like, oh, yeah, Crinkle Snitch. That was his name, Crinkle Snitch. Dancing around in that bikini, I'm mesmerized. Also, I want to say that this is the last full week of Dead Rabbit Radio until we go on break. I'll have two episodes next week, and then I'm taking a two-week break. During that two-week break, I will be in Port Gamble, Washington for the Port Gamble Ghost Conference, where I will be giving a presentation, Why Are There No fat ghosts it's a brand new presentation with the same old title as my last one if you're in the area please come out to port gamble washington i'll put info in the show notes so you can buy your ticket i will be there friday night giving my presentation and hanging out with you guys afterwards as long as you're not wearing gold bikini briefs walking into dead rabbit command right now we have one of our legacy patreon supporters everyone get on your feet and give it up for Matt Sprinkle. Woohoo! Yeah! Wee ha ho! Yeah! Dancing around. He's, he's fully dressed though. Doing a little jig, dancing into Dead Rabbit Command. Matt, you're going to be our captain, our pilot this episode. If you guys can't support the show financially through Patreon or PayPal or merch store, that's fine. It truly is. Just help spread the word about Dead Rabbit Radio. That helps out so much. You have no idea how much that can help. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone you know Dead Rabbit Radio is your favorite paranormal show. Matt, let's go ahead and get this party started. I'm going to toss you the keys to the Dead Rabbit Dirigible. Glide us out of Dead Rabbit Command as we fly all the way out to Massachusetts. Nice, leisurely ride in a blimp. Far above the chaos of America below. The world below, right? Everything's going crazy in the world. It's been like this since the dawn of time, but now with 24-hour news, it seems like everything's falling apart. What can we count on the most in such trying times? Whether or not our presidents have genitals, right? That is what you're saying every time you're like, CNN, this is nice, you're reporting all this news, but what's in Obama's pants? That's the question that everyone's been wondering this whole time. Well, luckily, we know. (laughs) You're like, Jason, of course we know. He's a man. He's an adult man. No, 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 no. See, you just think you know. But do you really know? October 6th, 2023, we're in Falmouth Heights Beach, Massachusetts. Off of Oyster Pond Road and Surf Drive intersection. If you guys are familiar with the area, if you happen to live in Massachusetts, uh, maybe you've heard of this. (laughs) Maybe you actually saw this in your local news. You're like, Jason, I'm pretty sure if I did, I would have checked myself into a mental asylum because there's no way a newspaper would ever report this story. You live in this area, you should go to this place, maybe pick up some evidence or take photos of yourself reenacting the story, <laughs> walking around with your pants down. Let's go ahead and take a look here. We're in Massachusetts. Apparently, according to eyewitness sources, on October 6th, 2023, at this location, President Barack Obama pulled up in a limo along with three Secret Service agents. And Barack Obama's wearing like 
jogging clothes, shoes, pants, probably a shirt, right? I don't think he's running around. I don't think he's running around like he's training for a 90s action film. Probably a shirt. And the service, Secret Service agents were dressed like Secret Service agents. Slacks and like starched shirts. They have the little like wires coming out of their clothes or they go, Roger, Roger. President Obama is stretching. Repeat. President Obama is stretching. President Obama is stretching. <laughs> the other Secret Service agents are like, we're standing right next to you, Bob. You don't have to speak into the cuff of your shirt. We can obviously see President Obama is stretching. He's got his running shoes on. He goes, hey, keep up, boys. And he starts jogging. And the Secret Service agents are like, well, I guess we got to jog with him, too. <laughs> Their pants are all getting all dirty. They're, like, wearing dress shoes. They probably don't have the best traction. But these are trained security people. They're running alongside the president. Keep up, boys. Uh, you know, during my presidency, I could outrun all of y'all. And he's just running. And they're running behind him. He's trash-talking them the whole way. I could get you fired. I could ruin your career if you lose this race. They're jogging down this bicycle path. He thinks outside the box. There's supposed to be bicycles on this path. He's like, let's jog. Let's jog for America. He's just, <laughs> that's the worst Obama impression. I don't even know <laughs> who's that supposed to be. Well, it's supposed to be Obama. He's jogging. His three Secret Service agents are jogging with him. And all of a sudden, Get on the ground! Get on the ground! They hear voices from the bushes on either side of the bicycle path. It takes everyone off guard. Get on the ground now! And four dudes holding pistols jump out of the bushes and aim them at Obama. Get on the ground! Uh, what is going on here? This, this, I'm the president. What are you thinking? Get on the ground now! President Obama doesn't know what to do. He's never had four guns aimed at him at the same time. At least not to his knowledge. There might have been a couple of sniper attempts over his eight years of a presidency. But as far as he knows, there's never been four pistols aimed at him at once. So Secret Service, man, they jump right into it. One of them jumps in front of Obama and starts to pull out his sidearm, but too slow. <laughs> Secret Service agent catches a bullet right to the head. Ugh, falls to the ground. Secret Service agents now also grabbing their guns talking into their microphones, we need backup. <laughs> They're both dead as well. President Obama is facing down these four armed men coming out of the bushes. Oh no. No, this isn't the way it was supposed to. <laughs> uh, do you know who I... <laughs> uh, I'm president. <laughs> Why? Gunshots echo. <laughs> Gunshots echo through this heavily trafficked part of Massachusetts. At least bicycles. Bicycles are... People are driving their bicycles around the body. So they're like, hey, get out of the way. Did you guys not know this? President Obama and three Secret Service agents were gunned down in Massachusetts October 6th. You go, how come I didn't read about this in the newspaper? Why am I hearing about this from a conspiracy podcast? This, this should be national news. Right now you're logging online. Is this true? Quora, did President Obama get shot in Massachusetts? Well, the guys who came out of the bushes, these weren't just like gunmen. These weren't just, you know, robbers. This wasn't a random crime. No, these were actually special forces operatives working for the true president, Donald Trump. The real president the United States are always going to make sure I, I laugh at just the right time so the YouTube algorithm doesn't think I'm actually serious and yank the channel. We all know we've been following real raw news for the past couple years. We know the saga. Hillary Clinton, adrenochrome addict, died in Guantanamo Bay while pooping herself. I'll put all these episodes in the show notes. All these greats, all these classics. Mike Pence and his Asian gay lover gunned down. By Donald Trump, not Donald Trump himself, that would be even more fascinating, but by Donald Trump's forces as they were speeding away on an ATV to another gay lover hideout. Joe Biden is not the real president of the United States, not in the sense that he didn't win the election, although that is a, that is part of the narrative for Real Raw News as well. But he's actually currently being played by an actor. The real Joe Biden is either dead or the hologram got blown up. I'm not for sure. I'm kind of lost in the whole Joe Biden thing. But anyways, what you need to know is Donald Trump, true president of the United States, Barack Obama, dead? 
Well, after these special forces agents came out here to shoot Barack Obama, they do what every agent does in an assassination. You have to confirm the kill. Well, in this case, that involved pulling down Barack Obama's pants. This is how they were going to confirm whether or not they actually killed Barack Obama. So they yank his pants off, and he has no genitalia. And the special forces go, damn it! Another clone. <sighs> the real Barack Obama got away from us. If only there was a way <laughs> to catch this highly photographed, some would say, in love with the camera, ex-president who's doing interviews all the time, if there's only a way to catch him. We thought this trap in the middle of this bike path would do it, but no, this was just another clone. And they pulled his pants down to make sure that it was not the real Barack Obama. I also don't know, because it could have not have been a clone, it could have been a body double. So it would have male genitalia. And then how would they know? They have like a picture book, they're like holding up photos to it, they're like, nope. No, these are confirmed photos of the real President Obama's penis. And this is clearly not that one. They're all measuring it. They're like, oh, I don't know. Maybe in the right lighting, it might look the same. They, I don't know how they would account for that. But obviously, if they didn't have any genitals, Barack Obama does have two kids. So we know that he had genitals at some point in his life. In this case, he didn't have any. But there was a twist to this story. And this story, if you're not familiar with real raw news, it's just insane ramblings of a man who goes by the moniker Michael Baxter. And if you think this is some like kook website, it is. But this kook website brings in around fifteen to $20,000 a month in donations. So it's highly, highly trafficked in this part of the conspiracy theory world. A lot of people are donating money to this site. There's a new wrinkle. Not only is they pull his pants off, he had no genitals. What happened was after they shot him and after President Obama goes, why? That's his last word. He couldn't figure out why he was being shot. Being a clone, would be I mean, I think that would be a good giveaway. I'm like, well, I am a clone. So I'm obviously being cloned because somebody wants to kill somebody and I'm a decoy. But apparently after they shot him, when they went over to check his pulse, he caught on fire. This is a self-destruct mechanism. Michael Baxter said the body began to burn from the inside out. And it's like the hand started burning first and then the arms. As the body is burning, they pull his pants down. And check the generals. <laughs> I mean, I thought it'd be fair. I might be not a special forces guy. But if there is currently an incinerating body near me, <laughs> Obviously, that's not the real Barack Obama. Real humans don't explode when you kill them. That should be proof enough. But as the body is burning, they yank this guy's pants off and see that he has no genitals. I would assume if anyone immediately bursts into flames after killing them, they weren't a person. That's just me. I don't know a lot about human biology, but I would assume that's one of the things. People don't burn from the inside out. Immediately after getting shot in the head. But, you know, it's a wacky world. Who knows what's out there? That is the latest from Real Raw News. And again, I always like to highlight this. I say that they make between fifteen to $20,000 a month. I like to highlight how much money they make. And I go through the comments, too. Because they get a ton of comments on all of these articles, of course. People believe that this is real. People believe this is real. Here's a quote. This takes a little bit of context. So the there's an idea that Michelle Obama is actually a man named Michael. And the kids are adopted. Sasha and who's the other one? I don't remember. Tara. Sasha and Tara are adopted. Uh, Barack Obama's a homosexual man. And Michelle Obama is actually Michael, his gay lover. This is a, oh, this conspiracy theory is going back. During the original election, right? What was, dude, that was a long time ago, what, 2008? That Michelle was actually Michael. So there's a little bit of context for this insane quote. I mean, you're like, whoa, 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 slow down, what? I've never heard that conspiracy theory before. I've heard it so many times. I've been hearing it for almost 20 years at this point. Barack Barry, what they call him. They're like, well, we're not going to call you Barack. We're going to call you Barry. I was like, what? Well, that's not an insult. That's, what, that's just the name. Barry and Michael... And they adopted their kids, Sasha and 
I don't remember the other girl's name. But anyway, she's probably thankful for that. She's like, I'm glad you don't remember my name. This is the insane ramblings. Here's a comment from someone going by the name Grant Wilson. Quote, how awkward it would be if cloned Barry or Brock, if cloned Barry and Michael try to reenact the now famous hashtag real Joe Biden walking into the White House with Barry on his knees, taking in the nothingness into its fake mouth. Sorry, I enjoy the show a little too much, evidently. Unquote. So, I mean, that was a sentence that a human wrote. It's not a bot. I get what he's saying. Like, I guess Joe Biden walked in one time and Barack Obama was giving uh, Michelle, a.k.a. Michael, uh, oral sex a blowjob because it's another man? I guess that happens at some point. I've never heard that before. I've never heard that Joe Biden was like, hey, uh, Barack, I need your uh, advice on some paperwork. What? I don't, I've never heard that story before. But now I guess the clone is blowing another clone and there's nothing there? Then why would they do that? They're clones, not idiots. They'd just be like, oh, uh, we don't have genitalia. Let's just like sit and talk. I guess they both burst into flames. Ah, they're running around, and Joe Biden's like, oh, man, am I having a some sort of Alzheimer moment? Like, what is going on? There's just two flaming Barack Obamas running around the White House. So I don't know, but anyways, apparently Grant Wilson's enjoying that show a little too much. There's a man right now, as you're listening to this episode, there's a man out there right now kicking back, daydreaming about a clone blowing another clone and going, yeah. And then he imagines Joe Biden walking in and he's Grant Wilson's like, yep, now the party really starts. No matter how weird the world gets, <laughs> how bizarre the world gets, there's always something weirder out there. And in this case, it might be Grant Wilson. Matt, Sprinkle, let's go ahead and tie you the keys of the carpenter copter before you cancel your Patreon. You're like, why am I on this episode? Matt, I'm going to throw you the keys to the carpenter copter. We are leaving behind... Massachusetts, fly us all the way out to Brazil. It's July 2022, and we're about to meet a young man named Matthias. Matthias Gamara is his name, Gamara. He is a Patreon supporter, and he recently sent me this story about the time that he was traveling through southern Brazil and Paraguay just taking a family trip. Him and his family live in Brazil. And at night, we got into a pretty minor traffic accident. He goes, everyone was fine, but both headlights were busted. So we knew we couldn't drive the car anymore. He goes, we are six hours from home. We're going to have to figure out a way to get a tow truck and all that stuff. So they ended up calling their insurance company and they got a tow truck and a cab to come out to pick them up. The issue is, is that there wasn't enough room in the cab for everyone in Matthias' family. But there was room in the tow truck. And since the tow truck was taking the car to the same place that the taxi cab was, that everyone was going home, it was a six-hour trip, the tow truck driver, who normally does not allow this to happen, he said, I normally don't take rights for people, because Matthias was, you know, he goes, listen, Brazil's a pretty violent place. So <laughs> the tow truck driver's like, his steering wheel is made out of sawed-off shotguns. His comb is a 44 revolver. He goes, you know what? Normally, I don't let people that I don't know in my tow truck. But, I mean, you would, you would have... I think the taxi cab was paid for by the insurance company, the first one. But to get a second taxi would be a ton of money for this six-hour trip. Tow truck driver says, tell you what, I will let you hang out with me in the cab of my tow truck. However, we're going to have to stop by my place first and pick up my wife. Because this is going to be such a long trip, uh, and it, it's at midnight at this point. By the time that they make the phone call to the insurance, by the time the taxi and the tow truck shows up, it's been hours. It's midnight now. He goes, I'm going to need my wife to drive me back. But he's, he's like, yeah, sure. You know, he's really in no room to 
be picky about it. He's like, no, take me home right now. What you do after you drop me off is your business, no matter how dangerous it is. Yeah, yeah. Let's go pick her up. And he says they drive out, pick up the wife, who we will call Maria. And they're all talking to each other. And Matthias goes, I am a horror author. Horror author. <laughs> I was going to make sure I pronounced that correctly. You're like, what? He writes books about prostitutes? He writes horror novels, spooky books, spooky stories. And he goes, a lot of times, like, fictional scary stuff doesn't scare me. So I always try to find high strangeness stories and things like that. Real life paranormal, real life scary, freaky, tragic events. So on to this six hour long tow truck ride, he goes, I'm going to ask this veteran tow truck driver and his wife, hey, have you guys ever seen anything crazy out here? You guys have any spooky stories for me? And Maria goes, yeah, I got a few. I got a few. Maria said a long time ago, and some of the details Matthias goes, I don't remember if this story happened before Maria was born or if she was a young girl when it was going on, but Maria goes, my father's a police officer. My father's a police officer, and being a police officer in Brazil, of course, it's very, very dangerous. You'd have open gun battles in the street. <laughs> Get over here, get over here. Cover me, cover me. Very violent country. Well, Maria, we'll, we'll say her father's name is Jacob. Maria goes, my father, Jacob, one particular night, him and his fellow police officers were involved in an open, running gunfight in the slums. Put your guns down. Come and get them, copper. Bullets bouncing everywhere, glass shattering. Jacob and his fellow officers are engaged in this gun battle, and they're shooting the criminals. Some are giving up, but there's one guy who's standing there, and he just keeps shooting back at the police. And the police come out of cover, take a couple shots, get back down under cover. More bullets are coming their way. And Jacob's like, dude, I swear that I shot that guy. Like, I swear that I just shot that guy. How is he still standing up? And Jacob would kind of peek over the car and get his gun ready. Pop, 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 pop. Duck back down before he can take return fire. And as he hears the bullets whistling over his head, he goes, I know that I hit him that time. I know that I hit him probably two or three times with that volley. How is he still standing up? And the officers, they are. They're actually shooting this dude multiple times. He's not going down. But what they notice, what the police officers notice, is there seems to be an amulet hanging from this criminal's neck. And whether it was superstition or intuition... Jacob and the other officers realize we got to get that amulet off of his neck. <laughs> Not, I mean, this is a crazy story. Crazy story, right? So the officers, they keep shooting and they keep getting cover and bullets keep flying their way. And they're moving closer and closer to this dude. They know that they actually have to take that amulet off his neck. He's not going to go down until they do that. He's been riddled with bullets. He's still standing up, returning fire. Eventually, they do get close enough to him. The fight turns into a physical fight. They're now grappling with him, stabbing him. Then Jacob snatches the amulet off of this guy's neck. Stabs him in the heart. And the criminal immediately drops dead. Now, you could argue, <laughs> you could argue it was the stab in the heart that did it. That every other bullet and every other attack failed to do immediate damage. But to the officers there and to Jacob, 
who apparently passed the story along to his daughter, or maybe she heard it from her mom, but she had heard the story. It was the amulet. It was the amulet that was keeping him from going down. And Matthias said, he goes, you know, he apologized several times in his email. He goes, this happened a year ago. It was over the course of a six-hour journey. I heard many stories during my time. There are certain details that I don't remember. And he goes, one of those is whether or not Jacob kept the amulet. I would argue probably right. If there was an amulet that, when wearing it, prevented you from dying, <laughs> you were a police officer, you might, you know, tuck that in under your shirt. But would you think, like, there's something evil about this? Like, obviously, this is probably, <laughs> probably bad news. God's not normally like, hey, you don't want to get shot by... The police officers, you want to commit crimes as long as you want? Here you go, son. An amulet blessed by St. Michael himself. I mean, it could be possible that a criminal could come across a holy relic. It's also more likely that a criminal would work with darker forces to craft such a thing. But imagine that. Imagine an amulet that made it impossible for you to die. But you could also hand wave the whole thing. And you go, there have been reports of people being shot multiple times and not dying. And then getting stabbed in the heart. <laughs> getting stabbed in the heart will generally do it. Maybe it was just all a coincidence. Maybe if they'd stabbed him in the heart before he snatched the necklace off, then he would have died anyways. Who knows? But that's not the end of the story of Maria and her father, Jacob. And I think the second part of the story, whether or not Jacob kept the amulet, he may have been affected by it just by holding it, just by being that close to it. He may have been twisted by whatever forces dwelled within that amulet. Maria said when she was a child, her father was a good man. He was a loving father, provided for the family, did a dangerous job. He was a police officer, but he still made time for his children, for his wife. He was a good person. Most of the time. But some of the time. Maria says. She can never predict it. Never knew what any triggers were for it. Never knew how to avoid it. Maria said sometimes I'd come home. And my dad would just be standing there. In the living room. Drooling. She'd walk in and she immediately knew this was going to be a bad night. I mean, obviously, it's not like you guys are going to sit around and watch The Simpsons when he's like this. But it got worse. She goes, you'd walk into the house and you'd be in different rooms. It wasn't always in the living room. You'd walk in and he would be just standing there drooling. And his eyes would bore into you he would just stare at you but it wasn't this vacant look it wasn't like someone who was drooling because they were like an inmate at an asylum no it was drooling as if he was a rabid dog and the eyes were the same it wasn't that he was just staring at you it was this predatory gaze you felt like an attack was imminent you felt like you were in danger. You were in danger of your own father and you'd walk in and he would just be standing there drool dripping out of his mouth, his eyes staring at you as you moved through the room. And those were the good times when he was like this. Because sometimes you would walk into the room, he'd be drooling, he'd be staring, and he would rush you grab you, and begin beating you down with his bare hands. She said it happened to me, happened to other members of the family. He was enraged. He was a different person. She goes, it wasn't my dad. 
It wasn't my dad. He was something else. Something else entirely. He was a stark raving lunatic, but it wasn't my father. It was like he was possessed. Sometimes he would just smash stuff. Sometimes he would not just silently stare. He would start growling at you as well. His drool is continuing to pour from his mouth. And again, those were the good times. Once he started physically beating them up. And you never knew what you were going to get. She said, most of the time, totally loving father and husband. Sometimes, sometimes drooling idiot in the corner of the room with the eyes of a rabid dog. Those were worse, but better than getting beat up by your father who's growling in your face. Drools dripping on you as blows continue to pummel you into the carpet. And this was her life. It was a crapshoot. You didn't know what you were going to get. Even if you came home and he was all just drooling in the corner, you would be like, well, at least he's not beating me up. <laughs> I can go upstairs, I can do my math homework. But what a, what a chaotic environment to live in. And she lived in it for quite a long time because years later, Maria is now a teenager having to deal with this. But you make do. It's just something that, uh, you know, what are you going to do? You're a kid. So at this point, she's a teenager and she's at church. And Matthias goes, I don't know if this was a church authority who told her this or it could have just been a random parishioner. He goes, I don't remember. But somebody this particular day at church, somebody told Maria, they said, Be careful. You have to be careful because the devil is going to come to destroy you. And he'll be wearing little crystal shoes. Now, whether or not you heard that from your priest or you just heard it from someone in the congregation... What what would that mean? Like you get the you get the whole devil. You're like, who's the devil? What this is my first day at church? What who's this devil you speak of? Obviously, you get the first part of that. But little crystal shoes. How would you even like? Okay, I'll, I'll stay away from ballet academies for a while. I will stay away from the prince's ball. But like, what are you doing? Again, you're a teenager. You're like, great, thanks for the advice. I have to go home. My dad's possessed. He's freaking out. Or not, I don't know. But uh, see you next Sunday, I hope. What do you do with that advice? That night, though, she went home. Dad's not in the living room. That's probably, you probably have a checklist. You're like, oh, okay, dad's not in the living room. It's like a game of Clue. You're like, dad's not in the living room. Now to check the other seven rooms to see where the untold terror lies. Dad's not in the living room. She goes into her parents' room to say goodnight. She walks in and her mom is on the bed sobbing. And dad is in the room staring, drooling, showing his teeth. He's just staring at Maria. And Maria, this is what happens when people are in traumatic environments for a long period of time. She just ignores it. She just pretends that she didn't see it. Walks out of the bedroom. She goes to her bedroom. She goes, I get in bed and I'm facing the wall. And I'm just thinking. When... I feel the presence of my father standing behind me. So she's on the bed. She's on her side. She feels her father is standing right next to the bed, right behind her. And it's impossible. Door didn't open. She didn't hear him approach. But she could feel him. And she rolls over and there he is standing, towering over her as she's laying in bed. 
And she thinks in this moment, little crystal shoes. He moved silently through the house. Got to her door, opened it. Walked all the way into her room and stood there and she didn't hear a sound. Little crystal shoes. Jacob grabs his daughter and yanks her out of the bed. Drags her into the living room. And begins to beat her harder than he ever had. This was it. This was it. As blow after blow rained down on her and she's trying to defend herself. She's trying to curl up. She's trying to somehow prevent this massive amount of force that this grown man is using against this teenage girl. This is it. He's beating her that badly. When all of a sudden, Maria sees something grab onto her father. She goes, I didn't see what it was. I didn't see any sort of form. I just saw this light. And she says, it grabbed my father so he can no longer beat me. And I'm looking at him and his arms are pinned against his body. And I watch him get dragged back through the living room by this invisible force. He slides backwards as it's grappling onto him, pulling him away from her. And then he just passes out and crumples onto the living room floor. Maria said that was the last night my father ever acted that way again. No more beatings, no more drooling, no more standing in the living room or any room, staring at his family like their prey. All of that ended the night, the light, saved her life. Super interesting story, right? Matthias goes, I was expecting stories about like weird car accidents they came across. He got a up close and personal story about a young girl growing up in a home with a, from what we could guess, and I'm sure they probably figured this back then, a demonically possessed father. You could argue mental illness, right? Uh, you could definitely argue that. I think I think the getting pulled backwards by an invisible force and being immediately cured rules that part out a little bit, but fascinating story nonetheless. A fascinating story. And it may or may not be related to the amulet. Uh, Mathea sent me five of these stories. He said that she told even more, but these were the five he thought was the most creepy, and I took those two, the amulet one, and, and I think they are related. Or definitely could be related. I think it would be very easy to become possessed or enthralled, especially if he still had that amulet, right? We don't know. That would be a hard thing to get rid of. Even if you thought it was demonically possessed, you might keep it in your locker at work or something like that, right next to your service revolver. You're like, I don't know why I keep shooting innocent people. It's like my gun is a mind of its own, and it's drooling. Could have been from the amulet. Most, you know, again, if these stories are connected, that wouldn't make sense. But it's terrifying because we have the story of a otherwise good man who was just doing his job and came face to face with a paranormally powered 
criminal. Which opens a whole other host of stuff, right? I can't gloss over that. I was about to go into, I was about to finish that thought. I go, I can't gloss over that. That in and of itself is pretty awesome. I mean, that's pretty much the, the plot of Child's Play. It's the plot of an entire franchise and now a three season television show. You have a paranormally powered killer. And you would have to, I mean, that that's just, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to forget what I was originally talking about because that's just amazing. You have that idea that if you had this amulet, even if it required dark magic to make it, I mean, you'd be unstoppable. You'd be unstoppable, especially if it was gangster on gangster warfare or gangster on civilian warfare. The police officers had the men and the firepower and the and the intuition to get close enough to him to snatch that necklace off if it was just you were doing a drug deal and this guy decided he wanted the drugs and the money didn't want to make a good deal it's the oh you have so many ambush situations when you're a criminal it's mostly ambush combat and you assume if i get the drop on this guy and shoot him first then i'll get away with it but if you shoot the guy in the head and he's still alive then what's your plan b he didn't expect that he was going to have an amulet that would keep him from dying. I would be curious if if they could actually see bullet holes appearing in him, or did it seem like the bullets were bouncing off? You know, Maria wasn't present for the shoot, shootout, right? She wasn't like, take your daughter to work day. And he's like, oh, come on. We're going to go through the slums of Brazil. Come with me, little one. Yeah, that whole whole thing. And I could honestly go off on another 10 minutes about that, but... What I do want to talk about, though, I'll go back to this. I'll save that for another episode. You have this good man who comes into contact with pure evil. And the stories are that the evil gets vanquished. Or the evil becomes good. Or worse, an anti-hero. The cop and the criminal who can't die join forces. To clean up the slums of Brazil. The idea of the good man, the proud father, the loving husband, coming into contact with evil, and then it's so dark. It's so full of anguish and bitterness and hate. This amulet, this forged mystical item is just so toxic to the human soul that it can turn a good man bad. Turning a good man into a man who would beat his family. And, and even when he wasn't beating them, just terrifying them. And from what we can tell in this story, he was about to murder his daughter with his bare hands. And that is when the light intervened. But even that opens a whole host of questions. What took the light? so long to save Maria and her family. It's a fascinating story. And it's a story that has more questions than answers. The story of a family in Brazil who became infected by true evil. True darkness turned a good man into a snarling, drooling beast. Until he wasn't. Until the light redeemed him. And if this could happen to him just because he came into contact with this evil... If it is the amulet, which is the theory I'm going with, what about all the other police officers who were at the gunfight that night, who were wrestling with this man, who were trying to get this amulet off? Just being near it, was that enough to infect you with this demonic entity? How many police officers handled that amulet? Was it just Jacob and the couple of cops who were on the scene? Or was it handled by an evidence inspector? Was it given to the sergeant to look at? Was it passed around the police station 
as an oddity for a period of time? Is it possible that just by being near this thing, by holding it for a minute or two, that was enough for a bit of that evil to soak into your skin? We don't know if Maria's story is the story of one family or the story of one family that actually happened to half a dozen families. Other fathers infested by this darkness is the only reason why we know Maria's story is because she survived the events. And the children in those other homes weren't saved by the light. They were beaten and tormented and eventually killed by their own fathers. You would imagine if that was the case, you would find articles of that in the newspaper. But maybe not. Maybe not. This happened over the course of a decade or more for Maria. We would imagine the same thing could play out for even longer in some of these other families. And none of these families were telling people outside the family what was going on. It was their secret shame. Were there more Marias? Were there more victims who didn't get to tell their stories? Were there other young boys and young girls trying to ignore the brutality of their home life. Until one night, their fathers slink through the darkness of their homes, moving silently towards precious prey, wearing little crystal shoes that turned them from proud dads into heartless killers. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. TikTok is at deadrabbitradio. Dead Rapper Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great